we actually know now more than we did five years ago, just how carefully they were engineered to suck you in. They, they, they don't care about what's actually good for you. All they care about is that you're giving them attention. They can use that. They can sell data, but they can also use the data to keep mining your your attention. And it's, it's almost like you, you feel like some of these big tech companies imagine human beings as just sort of batteries to, to draw energy from. Here we go. Welcome to a special edition of the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. We call these special editions The Way is Love. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Who's up for a little soul work? Years back, a friend and I greeted each other by one of us saying rock and roll and the other answering fill the soul. It was a nice reminder of how playing or listening to music could be an exercise that is soothing to the soul. It was also a great reminder that we actually have a soul and that soul has to be considered and is moved by the action of our lives and minds as well. We aren't talking music or rock and roll today, but we are talking about the soul and the mind with co-author Joshua P. Hochschild of the book Mind at Peace, Reclaiming an Ordered Soul in the Age of Distraction. The book is laid out to act as a good companion that we can turn to, whether you're in need of comfort or virtue, a refresh of your moral compass, or want to reawaken the sensations of the heart, body, mind, and soul, you will want this book near you. Chapters give an opportunity for contemplation or active discernment with thought-provoking questions to reflect on. And joining me now is Professor Hochschild. Professor, thank you so much for joining us today on the Way is Love podcast. Privilege, David. Thank you. Yeah. You know, I like to start us off and, you know, for our listeners as well, with the beautiful prayer that opens your book. Uh, to the Holy Spirit. So I'll just read that prayer, then that will inform our conversation. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work, too, may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me, then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you're a, you are, of course, a teacher. And I noticed that one of your courses is called Friendship and Contemplation in the Digital Age. Yeah. Can you tell me about that classroom? Yeah, I will. Um, it's, not a, it's not one of the courses that I regularly teach because we have a heavy, a heavy course load in some poor undergraduate courses and and there's a seminary curriculum that follows a strict path. But um, occasionally I, I get to sort of teach outside of the standard curriculum and, and invent a new topic. And a few years ago, I, I taught a course. Uh, I've done a couple different versions of it. I noticed that I, I was talking about big ideas in philosophy in my classroom, and my students weren't realizing how it connected with all of their concerns and anxieties outside of the classroom. And so I thought I would just take that problem head on and, and name a course after things that I knew were, were on their minds. And we read things from the history of philosophy, but also some contemporary reflections. And I wanted students to have a, a chance really to explore their own interior life. College is challenging enough uh, when, when young people are very self-conscious about making friends and developing friendships and what will happen to their friendships after they graduate. And this was, you know, for the first time, you know, seven or eight years ago, and students were very much aware that they were being influenced by social media, by carrying around smartphones, and I think looking for help to negotiate that. Mm -hmm. And another impetus for designing the course in, in the way that it was titled, as you read it, was that my good friend Christopher Bloom had asked me to collaborate with him on a book. Mm -hmm. I, I loved his idea for a book. It's, it's the book that we'll talk about. It's called A Mind at Peace reclaiming an ordered soul in the age of distraction. But as part of the preparation for that book, I thought that I would teach some of the material that we wanted to talk about with students and, and kind of trial run some of the ideas. And I hadn't planned this, but as a surprise, the students actually got to read a manuscript of the book. By the end of the semester, we had a complete draft. Wow. And so we spent the last two weeks essentially workshopping our book with a, with a group 
of, yeah. of young people who were personally struggling with, with all of the ideas that we wanted to share with them. So, yeah. And I just, there's, there's such a um, great quote in the foreword from uh, father Paul Scalia and, and it reads, quote, today's technology has in a sense robbed us of our face has disconnected us from ourselves. Our very faces have disappeared behind screens, close quote. And you're around this younger generation daily and you're able to observe their use of technology. And so again, quoting from the book, uh, quote, what we need is an approach to self-mastery that is deep enough and comprehensive enough to enable us to navigate the digital age while maintaining our peace within close quote. So how was this book written to be solutions-based? I mean, I, I have to give credit to the co-author that I mentioned. Chris Bloom had a, an idea for a book that um, I, I say is, is essentially a work of practical spirituality. We're both philosophy professors, so we had to be very intentional and self-conscious about this. We, we more typically write for academic audiences with a little bit more distance from our subjects. We knew we wanted to write um, an accessible, popular book, the kind of book that maybe could be used in a parish reading group or, or on a retreat where the chapters would be something to spend a little time with and reflect on. So each chapter ends with a short spiritual reading and with questions for reflection, almost a kind of examination of conscience. Mm -hmm. And the overall design of the book is meant to carry you through a reflection on the ways in which we encounter and uh, receive and process the world around us. So the three mm -hmm. main parts are about the exterior senses, very, very basic stuff of just about how we sort of navigate in the practical world. The second section is about what the philosophical tradition calls the interior senses. Uh, there's probably mm -hmm. other terms for it in in psychology, but the way that we regulate our imagination and our attention and the way that we, we shape our experience. And then the last section, which of course is the ultimate point of the book, is about the act actual rational powers, intellect, so that we can think clearly and so that we can pray. And those things are connected, actually. I think a lot of people don't, yeah. don't imagine those being being connected. But they're, they are both the, the higher functions of the intellect. And a lot of the distress that people experience or the sense of dissipation or distraction that they feel, it's partly a function of, you know, maybe needing to work on some basic virtues. So there's a chapter on courage and temperance. Yeah, yeah. But it's also partly a function of not really knowing how to direct one's thought processes and not realizing the different things that one has to do in order for one's mind to to see things clearly and, and to... Mm -hmm carry on a, 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 a fruitful conversation or to, to mm -hmm. puzzle through a, a difficult choice. Yeah. Those are very high level skills. And, and on one, in one sense, they're very basic. And you would think that in a very healthy culture, you would just learn those by participating in the culture. But we have, we have a culture that places so many demands on people that it, it's, um, it's often a matter of luck that they end up with an ordered mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's so true. And the book is laid out in a way that it's it, it can be taken in piece by piece. It's a kind of book that you're just going to keep referring back to. And you know, there's a moment when you mentioned that Saint Francis de Sales was had written thousands of letters over a few decades as the Bishop of Geneva, and this book, you know, you developed it with your co-author uh, through these kind of written conversations, yeah. a series of letters, really, and. So can you can you talk about letter writing? It's sort sort of a yeah. lost a lost art in our age, and and how that you know how the book came together with your co-author Christopher. Yeah, Bloom. and I, and I think it is important to note that it's not that Chris and I thought we were already experts or spiritual masters. We were struggling with this ourselves. Um, we're both fathers. We're, we're both raising children in this age. We're both teachers. We're, we're both just second guessing our own choices with technology. So we mm -hmm. learned. We learned about ourselves as we were trying to find what it is that we could share uh, with others. But I mean, people have asked me about a process of collaboration, and I don't think there's there's one way to do it. I've heard about many different ways that people can collaborate on a book, and I had never done it before. 
but I, I, I got a good enough sense of what Chris, Chris's overall vision for the book was. And uh, at first we decided we would simply talk about some of the themes and, and clarify how we thought the book should be organized in terms of, in terms of the, the exact chapters. And we, we shared some ideas for different kinds of authors and texts that we would want to uh, maybe try to engage. And we just started regularly having phone conversations that followed up email exchanges about what we'd been reading that week or ideas about things that maybe could be worked into the book. But this is before trying to write anything. This, it's just, mm -hmm. It was just the, mm -hmm. the process of turning ideas over in our minds. And establishing relationship in a way, yeah, right? Yeah, getting to know each other even better. I mean, we were old friends from graduate school, but we, we hadn't been in regular contact and we saw each other kind of intermittently at, at conferences. Mm -hmm. We both had complementary formation, enough in common, but enough that we were bringing some different things and enough respect for each other that we could take criticism from each other, which is really important. And, mm -hmm. and then um, after about a year of that, actually, then we set a, a schedule for writing chapters, but even the writing of the chapters felt more like sharing missives back and forth. So we would we, we, mm -hmm. we divided them up, and there were some that Chris knew he wanted to do, and there were some that I wanted knew that I wanted to do, and then we parsed out the rest. And we set a schedule, you know. So in two weeks, in two weeks, let's share drafts of, of the next two chapters, and that of course focuses the mind because maybe maybe the first week goes by and I didn't do much writing, but I you know I, I got to face mm -hmm. the music at the end. Next yeah. week, so I I pound out a draft, and I'm I'm not too ashamed if it starts out rough because I trust that Chris will uh, be forgiving, and and he's doing the mm -hmm. same thing. Uh, there are chapters in the book actually that I don't remember exactly how it got to be in that form. There's some that I remember. Yeah, I did the first draft of that, or I I, I was the architect of that one. But mm -hmm. often, you know, we would bounce them back and forth, and the the editing of the chapters itself was a further conversation about you know. How can we say this well, or what would be a good example, or, or does this fit with some, something that we, we've been trying to say in an earlier chapter? It, mm -hmm. Honestly, we, we both commented multiple times that it felt like it was accompanied by great graces from the, the Holy Spirit. It, it, it didn't. I, I, I'm, I've written enough that I know when writing feels like work, um, and yeah. I, I was surprised at how quickly this this um, came together for for both of us. And Chris said the same thing. I was feeling that sentiment as you were describing the process that that, that was really uh, it was really a collaboration with the Holy Spirit there that allowing those graces to flow through you both bringing those qualities to the process you know yeah. you know we're not machines obviously and yet so often we're compared to them even yeah. treated like them also forced to interact with them in many different ways through this technology. And in light of that, I just wanted to talk a little bit about human self-awareness mm. and why why that is so important now. Yeah. I mean, computers have gotten very good at replicating certain functions that we compare to human functions, uh, processing data, calculating, running an algorithm so that you get an output on the basis of an input. And, you know, at, at one point, I think we, when, when computers were new, I think we anthropomorphized the computers and, and described them with human terminology. And, you know, we, we talked about computers having memory and computers mm. um, solving things or knowing things even. Now I think computers have gotten so sophisticated and, and we've gotten a little insecure that we sometimes go the other way and use con computer terminology to describe what it is that human beings do uh, <laughs> and, and sort of reduce ourselves to a machine. But there are certain basic intellectual functions that are left out of the, all of those comparisons. And the most, the most basic one is in, instead of thinking of reason as moving from one thing to another, like a processing algorithm, it's the ability of the mind simply to receive something, to, to, to grasp and contemplate it, to wonder about it, to pose questions about it. The most, the most ancient metaphor for the, the work of the mind is to compare it to the, the relationship of the eye to light. Yeah. And you, you can use your eyes to gather information and, and collect things. And, but sometimes you just use your eyes to gaze. And we use our minds just to gaze too. And that's not something that anybody mm -hmm. working on artificial intelligence is even pretending to, to replicate. 
but that's, mm. that is crucial to our social nature. So when we're with a friend and, and yes, we want to interpret their words. We want to make sense of what they're, they're, they're saying, or maybe read between the lines of what they're not saying, but we also want to be present to them and then be present to us. And we want to simply consider them for who they are. And it's also crucial to our spiritual nature. That's, that's what prayer is. Prayer isn't thinking about God. I can run proofs for the existence of God, you know, as well as any philosopher, but that's not, that's not the same thing as prayer. Prayer is actually putting oneself in, into a state where one's attention, one, one's full rational attention, but uh, maybe rational isn't the right word even at that point, but, it, yeah. but it, it's, our, it's, our, it's, our, it's our mind is, is yeah. turning to and gazing upon as, as best it can a, a, a reality. And it's it's really putting our soul in that place too. It's a it's about the using the will <laughs> to put to place our soul in a place of listening or of silence, really, to allow for that quiet whisper to arrive that that arrives from within us. Often, that quiet voice yeah. that. Um, anyone who's had a somewhat contemplative life or spent some time in that kind of prayer knows and recognizes that when that voice comes. Yeah. I'm going to read a, a quote from the book here. Yeah. Um, so open quote, this book is about how to achieve the personal peace that comes from choosing and acting well. And so we will attend closely to ordering action. Close quote. So what are the, some of the actions requiring, you know, to establish this kind of inner peace as you lay it out in the book? I mean, there's a reason why just about every classic moral text begins with temperance and courage. Uh, yeah. And why, if you stop and think about it, any, any parent who's raised children realizes that those are the two, those are two of the things that you actually spend a lot of time um, helping to helping young people to practice, right? Temperance, con control of the will with regard to its appetites, being able to exercise mm -hmm. and pursue appetites in the right way at the right time. Right? Easy to say and give an abstract description of it, but then when you, when you're placed in a world full of temptations and full of um, multiple demands on on one's especially bodily desires, then you have lots and lots of occasions to practice that and lots and lots of ways that it can go wrong. And mm -hmm. courage, courage is, is a lot like temperance, but instead of with respect to bodily feelings of pleasure and pain, it's, it's more about with the, the sense of, of your dignity and worth and your, you know, the preservation of your very life, not just, not just feeling uh, pleasure, but it too requires self-regulation, self-control, knowing not just that you must stand firm in the face of certain kinds of risks or dangers, but being able to size up what those risks and dangers are and knowing mm -hmm. how much fear to feel in the face of those dangers and risks. These are, these are very basic. It's, it, they're discussed at the beginning of Plato's Republic. They're discussed at the beginning of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. Pick up any classic Catholic uh, spiritual guide and, and you'll have temperance and courage right up front. Yeah. One of the things that we tried to do in the book actually was, was to refresh certain concepts by not following some standard terminology. So we don't have a chapter called courage. We have a chapter called steadfastness and yeah. we don't have a, a chapter called temperance. We have a chapter called pure of heart just yeah. to help people think, okay, but maybe, maybe having a new vocabulary will, will remind people how these things are important. And it's not just the same old finger wagging advice about, about how we should be. Yeah. But those are important because, I mean, first of all, you can't you can't live a successful life if, if you don't have those those basic human virtues. If you don't have some some mm -hmm. self discipline, you you have you have other problems to worry about them. And prayer and friendship, but prayer and friendship do do also depend on a kind of interior temperance as well, as, yeah. as you were describing. That, um, that the ability to discipline our attention, the ability to set things aside, the ability to attend to what we should be attending to, even if there are other things placing demands on our attention at the same time. Yeah. Those, those are, in a way, they are extensions of those basic 
exterior virtues that we teach all children. Yeah. You mentioned your father and, um, you know, the, the, what young people are facing, what we're all facing, but young people, especially because maybe perhaps they don't have a reference point of before this time. Um, but you cite, you know, examples of how modern technology companies utilize, you know, cutting edge psychological research to literally addict us to uh, apps or their products how do you feel like (laughs) yeah i mean um it can be very depressing uh if you if you get too deeply into how how these things have been designed to insinuate themselves into our uh, into our interior life Um, on the other hand it's very heartening to realize how uh, first of all how appropriately disgusted people are when they hear about it Mm -hmm. and also how it's actually become kind of common knowledge today in a way that it wasn't when the book was first published right five five years ago it was still kind of news to people that social media was designed in certain ways to to be addictive and that social media companies described its users the way drug dealers do as users that, that that's yeah. why they're free because they're they're getting something valuable from you in exchange which is your attention and you know i think it's it's even more common knowledge today that that the key people who are behind the designing both the hardware and the software like the ipad and the iphone and the all the social media apps don't let their own children use it <laughs> yeah uh, and wow five, fancy that five years ago you know if you went if you took your children to a pediatrician there might be a few questions about, you know, how much time are you watching TV still? Uh, but now if you go to a pediatrician, if you take young children to a pediatrician, they'll ask very specific questions about how much, you know, what kind of devices do you use? How much time do you spend? What, what kind of regulation? Now, I, and I'm sure some people find that almost intrusive. I could imagine parents almost being offended that doctors are asking that, those questions, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it is appropriate. These are, these are issues of, of health and welfare. If, yeah. if pediatricians weren't asking them, someone would need to to help parents think through the choices that they're making uh, about the exposure that their children have to this technology, because it really is. And we we actually now know now more than we did five years ago, just how mm-hmm. carefully they were engineered to suck you in. They 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 don't care about your what's actually good for you. All they care about is that you're giving them attention because they. They can use that. Uh, they can sell data, but they can also use the data to keep mining your your attention. And it's it's almost like you 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 feel like um, some of these big tech companies imagine human beings as just sort of batteries to draw to draw energy yeah. from. And you even just use the term, which is mining your attention. Like it's just like wow, who sits in a conversation like the one we're having? <laughs> mind the other person's attention like, yeah I, I i i appreciate it yeah and the other thing is the book is so framed around virtues and you know these virtues were sort of always a very important cornerstone of formation around forming people that would then form societies you know that seems to have changed a lot in the recent generations so uh, why is it still important to really teach and have people learn about virtues. Well, virtues virtues are the qualities that that help us to achieve our good, that help us to achieve our end. And so, even if people are not thinking in the, in the kind of Aristotelian terms that um, I might think in a in a philosophy class, everybody is trying to be happy. Um, mm. Even the people who are doing what we think are terrible, reprehensible things, or the people who think they don't care about their own happiness, that they, they they are on some level they could only be doing what they're doing because they think it will somehow fulfill them, because it will somehow satisfy them. And you know, human a human being is a kind of creature, and so there is there are better and worse answers to what what will actually satisfy us, and and it's possible to be wrong about what will satisfy us. And given given that there are that there there are ways to be actually fulfilled or satisfied, there are qualities that we can have that that facilitate us that that help us help us fulfill that in the way that if you know that you want a clock to hang on the wall in in your room, 
you know what qualities yeah. it needs to have in order to fulfill uh, your uh, your need for that clock, right? It has to be accurate. It has to have a clear enough display so that you can read it from across the room. So the clock has virtues and human beings have virtues. They perfect us, but then that because we're social beings, they perfect our ability to be related to others. It, it could sound almost narcissistic to talk about, well, I want my perfections. I want my virtues. I want, I want my happiness. But if, if some of my virtues are the kinds of things that make it more more possible for me to be a good friend to someone else or to be a husband or to be a father, then that it's not selfish to to seek to be virtuous. It is it is actually one of the most generous things you can do. Mm. And uh, especially if you want to be a friend with someone else who's working on practicing the virtues, uh, then yeah. you can you can help share help share that. Aristotle says yeah. that in, in a sense only virtuous people can even be friends, that vicious people no matter how it's not that they're selfish and only care about themselves, but they don't even have the power to care about the good of another or make sacrifices for the good, good of another or be present to, uh, to another whole person. Um, and classically, not just in the Christian faith, but even in pagan religions, a good afterlife, something like heaven was always conceived of as a community, a, a place of mm -hmm. friendship where you were with others and a, a bad afterlife, a punishment for evil persons, was the the kind of self punishment that the evil had made them incapable of friendship. It was it was about being alienated and alone. It was about cutting mm -hmm. oneself off from. So the virtue the virtues are important for our individual growth, but they're also important because as individuals we were made to be in we were made to be in community with other human beings, and we were made to be in community with God. And so the virtues help us to be perfected as a person is to be perfected as something that can relate to other persons. It's just a lovely way of putting it. It's uh, you cultivate yourself as an offering for other, um, hopefully for God first and then for other. So, it, or it all becomes a one thing that leads to another. Tune in to part two of our conversation with philosophy professor Joshua P. Hochschild and the book Mind at Peace. Hey, thanks for listening. You can hear more conversations on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. For more about The Way is Love, go to thefocusingway.com.